So this is my first time playing Vegas. Um, and I'm a bit torn um, between wanting to do a little bit of amateur stand-up comedy here um, and sharing my presentation. And I, I think we'll all be better off if I stick with my presentation. But I do want to take the liberty of sharing a joke that one of our women in our Tai Chi study uh, shared with us this last uh, month. So she's an elderly woman. She came into class and she said, I went into the bank today, and I asked the teller, can you please check my balance? And the teller came out from behind the counter and pushed me. <laughs> so this joke's not entirely irrelevant, as balance will be a part of what I talk about today. So as far back as, as maybe more than 2,000 years ago, um, there were very wise people, like um, who advocated for what we would call today a more holistic approach to health and healthcare that recognized not just the body, but the body, mind, and spirit. And Plato wrote, the greatest mistake in the treatment of disease is that there are physicians for the body and physicians for the soul, although the two cannot be separated. That's pretty wise. So unfortunately, today, more than 2,000 years later, this holistic perspective is not fully appreciated in a lot of our academic medical centers, although leading thinkers like our speakers this morning are really starting to see that connection between mind and body and to appreciate that diseases like Parkinson's are not just physical conditions, but they impact our cognitive function, our ability to have attention, our mood, and our overall quality of life. And most importantly, and, and I guess this is my main message today, is that these processes are not separate, but they're highly interdependent. Um, and that issues of the body and mind uh, affect one, each other, one another greatly. And we know now, and I hope to share some of these ideas with you, and this is a bit of the focus of our research, is that how we move really greatly affects how we think, our cognitive function. Exercise and mobility is really important for shaping our, our thinking processes. But also how we think, and, and I think um, this was really uh, clear in our last presentation, executive function, our ability to pay attention to our body, our ability to multitask, really impacts how we move our balance and our gait. And importantly, better understanding the interdependence between these two things um, might lead to some new insights into how we can treat these conditions and uh, improve our overall quality of life. So traditional approaches to preserving and, and treating uh, physical and mental function haven't always been connected, whether it's in normal aging or in, in neurological conditions. And people who focused um, on physical function, things like balance and gait, have focused a lot on the physical body. And it's, it's almost the things above the shoulder and the parts of the brain that regulate uh, some of the cognitive pieces are completely irrelevant. And obviously, strength's really important, flexibility is really important, agility, those sorts of things are really important for physical function. On the other side of the equation, uh, we know that mental function is really important as well, and there are lots of really good tools um, that are out there, in including some of the discussion of the, the cognitive training you can do, um, social activities, being involved in the community, some of the things we've heard a lot about here, um, and pharmacotherapy. Um, there's a lot of research that's going on out there. It's really cutting-edge research by great scientists, and they're showing that even mild deficits, you can have perfectly clear um, memory, recall, short and long-term memory, but even small deficits um, in executive function, the ability to multitask, um, can impact how you walk and your risk of falling in Parkinson's and in normal aging. And what's also really interesting is that how you walk, how you move, starts is, is an independent predictor now of whether you're at risk for um, developing dementia later in life. So these things are really interconnected in, in very rich ways. And so this interconnection is really making us think, well, what's the best way to treat this 
complex holistic problem. Um, do, you, do we start to do Sudoku puzzles while we're on the treadmill? Um, do we do sort of multitasking, things like that? Um, and, and there are beautiful um, high-tech interventions that are being developed. Um, gaming systems, virtual reality, some, but some of these are, are still in early stages of development and they're not as accessible and they, and they may be costly. But there are some low-tech old systems out there and one of those mind-body training systems is Tai Chi. Um, this is a little schema, it's almost like a, a labyrinth or a maze that we saw earlier, which sort of takes what we call the active ingredients of Tai Chi and breaks them out into parts. And just to put a little bit of logic to what just happened there, um, we did some physical stuff. We were stretching, if you're looking at the top, I don't think this, this works here, but at the top of the clock, um, at 12 o'clock, there's musculoskeletal stretching. And you can imagine if you're standing and doing that, you're developing a lot of strength in your lower extremities and your spine, and, right? But we're not just focusing on the pieces, but how they connect. So that would be the second piece, which is dynamic integration. Okay? Um, we're doing active relaxation of mind and body. We're bringing the, them two together, and it's not just about doing. Okay? The yin-yang symbol of Tai Chi, there's a doing part, but there's an allowing part. And we heard from our speakers, sometimes slowing down might be interesting. It allows you to notice much more. Um, the awareness paying attention. We know that proprioception, feeling your body is really important. If you can have sensation in your feet and you start to lean in one direction or the other, the body has feedback. But if we can't feel these parts, they're not gonna give us the information, okay? Um, belief, imagery, what's it like to imagine your hand as water? Just that thought makes you move a little differently sometimes. Or if it's warm water, or it has a little sunshine, or this fountain of youth elixir. So imagery is really important, and this is a way of using those other parts of the brain, the frontal parts that we heard about, to feed back on the movement. Okay? There are many other things. The breathing is really important. But you get an idea. This is like a prescription with lots of ingredients mixed into one. But if you went home and someone said, so what is Tai Chi? We still need a definition and we have to write about this in science. So we define it as a simple mind-body exercise. We know that it's rooted in a lot of Asian traditions, the martial arts, the healing arts from China, and some philosophy. And it integrates slow intentional movements as you've experienced with breathing and a bunch of cognitive skills. And we focused a lot on being mindful, uh, focusing your attention, and a little bit of visualization or imagery. Um, and it aims to strengthen, relax, and integrate the whole person. Okay, so I'm gonna share a little bit of research um, from the literature, but before that, there's different kinds of evidence in science. And um, we do what's called both quantitative research, where we collect numbers that are objective, but we're also very interested in people's voice. What's, what's doing Tai Chi like for them? And I wanted to share a couple of experiences. I told my, um, one of our classes that I'm coming out here to share this um, presentation with you, and would they be willing to share some of their experiences, right? And some of these things you can never capture with numbers. So one person wrote, Parkinson stole the body I knew so well. Tai Chi has helped me become acquainted with the unexpected body I have and to be calmer with it. You get to know yourself a little bit more. Tai Chi has helped me use my brain less and trust more in other senses and sensation, the, the physical sensations, not just the thinking. And then confidence follows. I know more about breathing and laughing. We laugh a lot in our classes. I forget often to do both. And Tai Chi is about being, in a meaningful way, in moment to moment. Um, I have to focus on this, this woman said. I am much more proficient at doing than at being. And in our culture, more is better. Give it 110%, get someplace. But sometimes we miss things along the way. And Tai Chi helps us slow down. And we think that slowing down might be an excellent complement to some of these other um, more dynamic trainings. So how can Tai Chi be helpful uh, with, for people with Parkinson's disease? Um, and I'll just show some of the research very briefly. Um, and all of these will be in the slides that you have. Um, just to give you an idea of what kind of research is out there, there's probably a thousand peer-reviewed scientific articles on Tai Chi published to date. Um, and about 12 of those um, have focused on Tai Chi, and these are 12 uh, studies uh, that, are avail that I'm aware, avail aware of that are available to date. Um, eight of them are done in the United States and a couple in Asia. And there's a lot of variability in research. Um, some studied people with early onset 
uh, Parkinson's and at very early stages of development. Some have been more inclusive. Some have looked at later stages. And the quality of this research, just because it's research and published doesn't mean it's good. Some of these are very small studies and we need a lot more research and that's why we're very grateful for, for support. Um, I want to say something about balance because that's the area where there's most research has been done. Um, the best study to date um, is a study done in, in Oregon by uh, Dr. Fu Zhang Li. And it's a, it was published, and it's a landmark study because it's one of the first studies to be published in the highest tier journal, the New England Journal of Medicine. And maybe many of you have heard about this study. But this was a randomized trial where uh, about a, almost 200 people were evenly divided to receive six months of Tai Chi, six months of, or six months of re resistance training, or six months of simple stretching. All right? And they were followed over a period of time. Okay? And what they found over that time was, compared to the other two groups, the Tai Chi group improved significantly more in terms of a bunch of balanced tests in the laboratory. Um, and then what was really interesting was they looked at fall rates over that period of time. And over that period of time, there were 62 falls total in the Tai Chi group versus 186 falls in one of the control groups. And the, and the resistance training was in the middle. This is significant. To reduce falls by 50% in six months is really, really important. And this is not just adding Tai Chi to um, uh, doing nothing. This is comparing Tai Chi to another exercise. Right? So if you put them together, it might be even better. Why? Um, there's lots of research to suggest why, but we're strengthening our legs. We're improving our flexibility and the ability to adapt to little you know, dents in the sidewalk or something like that. Our reflexes are developing. There's some very wicked tests that people do in the laboratory where people are safe. They wear a harness and they walk and they'll move the floor underneath them. And people who've done Tai Chi training, elderly adults, um, react quicker and, uh, and can recover from a fall. Um, there's more heightened awareness. I think you got that idea from the proprioception. And that we know is very important. We just finished another study with um, adults with uh, peripheral neuropathy where the sensation in the soles of the feet is weakened. And by improving that sensation, we improve their balance and their gait. Um, one of the ones that's been mentioned before, um, I believe it was Melanie in her talk, was this idea of preventing a fall before it ever happens. And one of the, the, the unfortunate vicious cycles we see is, is related to fear of falling. Anyone who's falled, uh, had a fall or lives with someone like that, um, walks in a more tentative way. There's a fear, there's a holding of the body. And ironically, that fear of falling, that guarding, that distraction of, of what's really happening because you're worried about falling makes it much more likely to fall again. And what we find with Tai Chi is one of the mechanisms that really improves balance most is that relaxation, that people stand and go, oh, I can feel my feet. I can feel how I'm breathing. I, you know, it's, it's a confidence, and that anxiety that brings the center of gravity up begins to drop, and we use imagery like feel like a tree, feel rooted to the ground, and that gives people a lot of confidence, and we think that improves balance as well as all the other physical pieces. And the other piece I want to emphasize is that because of this fear of falling piece, because people um, with chronic illnesses sometimes are afraid to start exercises, and sometimes, unlike this group, are not encouraged to, people are resistant to go out and do things. And what we've seen in most of our studies is people who were afraid of exercise that started doing Tai Chi, not only did Tai Chi, but then started walking more, going to the gym and doing other things. This is a gateway exercise. It improves what's called self-efficacy, and that's been well reported. So there's still lots of gaps in what we know about what Tai Chi can do for Parkinson's, um, um, but we do know that it's safe, that it's effective for balance and reducing falls, quality of life, and maybe some aspects of gait, but that's still being studied. Uh, we need more studies to confirm these, but also to look at other symptoms, sleep quality, uh, GI function, um, uh, digestion and constipation, um, tremors. These are really haven't been studied at all. Um, we also think that research is important because we want to study the physiology. If we can know how that front part of the brain is better connected to the other parts that create movement, um, then um, it's going to um, help us 
figure out how to better teach this and how to combine these exercises with the other exercises you're doing in medications. Maybe they're optimal combinations of doing that. But think of Tai Chi as a complement, as not as an alternative. You should be doing all the other things you've been encouraged to do, but maybe you can add this to your regimen and, and on your in-between days of exercising vigorously. I think um, one of our speakers said, maybe just pick, uh, I think it was Melanie again, maybe just pick uh, the breathing or some piece of the package of Tai Chi and integrate it into your other activities. Uh, I do, I work, I walk on the treadmill quite a bit, I walk fast, but instead of watching CNN and all the crises that are going on in the world, I notice how my feet feel and whether my feet feel connected to my ankles and whether I can pay attention to my breathing. So you can integrate meditative mind-body techniques into your current regimens. One of the things that we emphasized here is that it's not just about the doing, but the non-doing, the allowing, the noticing, slowing down. And this is, I love some quotes by Lily Tomlin, who's one of my favorite comedians. Um, she said, why doesn't anyone try, say, try softer? as opposed to try harder. Sometimes that's work. And then the smaller text you might not be able to read says, for fast acting relief, try slowing down. Okay. And then finally, of course, um, participate in research because it'll benefit you and it'll benefit the knowledge that we can share with, with everybody else in the future. This might be the slowest exercise you guys have ever done here. <laughs> Um, certainly, we don't need aerobic music to do this. It's a very different kind of approach. It's, if you know the, the yin-yang symbol, this will be the yin to the more dynamic yang. Okay? But I hope that, that this starts to make sense. Okay? So what I'd like to do is invite you to do a little exercise with me. And uh, we're going to start with what we call hand tai chi. Okay? And um, if you can picture this, this is uh, when I give talks at the Harvard Medical School to my colleagues who think of what is Tai Chi. Um, I've had rooms of, of uh, gerontologists and neurologists in Grand Rounds doing these exercises. So um, please uh, join me and, and, um, and see if we can touch some of these core principles. So pick a hand, any hand. Um, if you have a hand that's better than another, uh, you might choose that one. And just put it in a comfortable position, okay? And I want you to just notice it. You know, uh, you could look at it, but more importantly, feel it. And notice the parts you can feel, maybe even notice the parts you can't feel. Not in a judgmental way, but just as a curious way. Okay? And I want you to just start extending all your fingers very slowly, just a stretch. And then relax the hand fully, as if it's really just being asked to chill out. Okay? And then I want you to just repeat this cycle a few times, just slowly stretching all the fingers, all the knuckles, the front of the hand, the back of the hand, and then relax it as deeply as you can. Okay? And just repeat this a few times. There's no rush. Don't go too far. You don't want to snap the fingertips off. Just a little moderation. And then back and forth. And one of the things that I hope you start to, to become aware of is that movement brings attention to your body. As you start to move something, it draws your attention there, and you might be able to feel it a little differently. Okay? So we're starting to strengthen our attention, our focus. Okay? Now what I want you to do is to see each time that you stretch and release your hand, can you notice another little part that you didn't feel before? Are there any knuckles that are being gypped out of this awareness exercise, this gentle stretching? Okay? Stretching, finding new little places, and then the resting, just observing a little deeper. It takes a little patience, so we're training your patience as well. Now, if I told you something you probably know, that you're about 70% liquid, right? That our body is mostly liquid, and it's a 98.6 degree tropical ocean, right? And I just left Boston, and it's minus 3 degrees, so that's a nice image. And that every time you stretch, you're inviting that warm, tropical, nourishing, healing liquid to start to lubricate all the ligaments and tendons and connective tissue and bones and joints in there, and then wash out any tiredness or inflammation. That this is like a living, dynamic ocean. And each time you stretch and bring your attention there, you're inviting that flow. It's almost like a, a glove, a very fine mesh glove, and you're stretching that elastic fabric and each time you rest and stretch, you might make it more elastic. Right? Now, if I said, why don't you play with coordinating this movement with a little bit of breathing? 
So as you breathe in, your fingers open. And as you breathe out, your fingers really relax. I mean, deep relaxation. Okay? And there's no rush to get to the next one. Maybe there wants to be a pause. And then you breathe in and you open all the fingers. Don't jip any of them, unless you don't care about some of them. And then you rest. Now here's the last little bit we'll add to this equation. Imagine someone stole a couple drops from the fountain of youth, this elixir. And in the heart of your palm, they put a couple drops. This heals everything for a few moments. Deeply relaxing, like a special nourishing energy. And as your fingers stretch, maybe it feels like warm sunshine penetrating all those fingers, relaxing, dissolving any tensions, and then resting. Okay. Now what if you can extend this process to your arm, like the exercises before, but much slower so you can notice. So not only are you doing your fingers, but as you do this, you extend your wrist and your elbow all the way out. And then you rested the arms a little. And the hands really rest. Okay. And then we do that again, breathing in, extending, noticing, trying to find new places we haven't felt before, be kind to them, stretch them, and then really rest them deeply. Good. And one more cycle. Good. Now because we're a little limited in time, I just want you to imagine doing this with your whole body. What if from your feet, through your back, through your arms, you're doing these big moves, stretching everything out, and then resting. And then you do that in more challenging situations where you have one leg in front of the other, where you're doing some of the stepping. But notice it's much slower, and there's a great focus on attention, feeling your body, and connecting the parts. Okay, And that's what Tai Chi is.